going on your Yankees fans welcome back to another video if you haven't already like comment and subscribe turn on that notification button so you can notify when a live stream pops or a video drops appreciate y'all uh, the thing I said on Wednesday I actually uh, kind of mixed it up because I thought the Red Sox series was this weekend it's actually the Detroit series we face the Red Sox series next weekend so that's where I'm going live with Sox Arizona on this channel to commentate and react with that being said, let's talk about the Yankees this series. I was not impressed the first two games. Third game, I was obviously more impressed. And a lot of people are having mixed opinions on certain things, and we'll talk about that as we go. So let's go into game one, which obviously kind of led for things to come, I guess, in terms of the series. And the Blue Jays, I said it at the beginning of the year. You can quote me. You can go back to my earlier videos. And some of my podcast episodes, even, you know, with CJ Pukala, the four line, I said the Blue Jays were going to be tough. And I'm going to say it like it is. Coming off the White Sox series, everyone was like, oh, you know, uh, the White Sox were the biggest threat to us in the American League. I don't think so. The Blue Jays, our own worst enemy in our own division. You know, we beat the White Sox fair and square. They're still a decent team right now. I have to check who leads that division, but the White Sox, you know, they're nothing like the Blue Jays are to us. Let's put it that way. The Blue Jays have had our number this year, kind of like the Rays did in years past. And I said at the beginning of the year, do not count the Blue Jays out. They're young core. I know their pitching looks a little shabby, and the pitching was good this series. Other than game three, the pitching was good. Manoa, and the game before that, Steven Matz. And we'll talk about Steven Matz here because the Yankees totally just shut out against him. It's like they didn't even show up to the game. And uh, the Red Sox, we have yet to face them and they lead our division. And we're going to start talking about, oh, you know, uh, no threats to us anymore in the American League. Okay, I get that's fan talk. I love fan talk, but let's, let's slow it down here. Because if the Blue Jays give us trouble, who knows what the Red Sox are going to give us. And we just won our first race series a couple of weeks ago or a couple of days ago i should say so let's let's pump the brakes a little bit this team has ways to go and especially with the new injuries it's not going to be a terrific journey it's going to have some road bumps with that being said let's talk about game one so i guess things started really going down in the third inning and it started off with an abysmal note it was a throwing error and a pickoff by kluber and then vladimir guerrero gets a two-run shot off of kluber Next inning, he comes out, and I really, that is a tough thing for Kluber. Come off a no-hitter, now he comes in the game, starts struggling, and now he's got tightness, now he's on the IL. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the rotation. It really is. It's going to be interesting when they call up Divey. You can't use Michael King, or you can, it just has to be, you know, in how many days of rest. And you have limited starters, and you can't wait till Severino gets back. That's going to be, what, late June, early July? So you can't necessarily, I don't know, man. It's going to be a interesting path to go. Right shoulder strain for him, and then Luke Voigt, uh, he has a right oblique strain. And we're going to talk about Chris Gittins at the end, because I'm very tired of this Yankees team really, I guess, neglecting him. And this is not something, a fake movement for cloud and content and stuff like that. No, it's not because, um, you know, Chris Gittens has been waiting his turn for how many years now, but Mike Ford's still up in the big leagues. Once again, let's start talking about game one. And I just did, obviously, with the Villado Guerrero two-run shot. King struggled in the fourth a little bit. Uh, he gave up a home run to Lourdes Gurriel, two-out uh, jam with a Joe Panic walk and then Marcus Semien single, but... He did get out of that jam, only allowing, I believe, a run. Yep, only allowed a run. That was in the fourth inning. In the fifth inning, first and second, nobody out. Uh, he got out of that jam. So he gets out of jams really well. And somebody said this on Twitter, and I think this actually might have some truth to it. That being said, he said, I think it's like MF Dorfman or something like that, an account on Twitter. It was, it was a fan, obviously. But my point is that he said that Aaron Boone didn't really – use King that well because he hadn't started or at least came in in nine days and I agree with that because if King has been looking shaky in the last couple of starts the last couple of appearances he's been looking shaky he was I don't think he's really like the first part of the year himself like his first part of the year self but that being said 
He's been shaky. He's been, you know, getting out of jams. I'll credit him with that. But if Boone doesn't use him correctly, gives him nine days of rest, you only need five if you're going to consider him a starting pitcher or at least a, I don't know, middle reliever that does some starting. And he might see some opportunities in the starting rotation now with Corey Kluber out. But the Blue Jays found ways to drive up King's pitch count. I mean, he had 41 pitches and two innings of work. But once again, that's all due to the jams and stuff like that. And the Yankees made Steven Matz look like Tom Glavin. I will read you his stats right now off of the Yankees. 6.2 innings pitch, 6 hits, 1 and run, and 10 strikeouts. I mean, that's that's literally what the Mets wanted out of Steven Matz. They traded him to the Blue Jays. There were some questions about whether he was going to be his former self. Well, against the Yankees, he looked like what he was supposed to for the Mets. So with that said, you know, the offense, once again, poor and dry and... It really sticks out when the pitching isn't good because the last couple of wins over, you know, the last couple of days, the White Sox and the Rangers, the offense didn't necessarily come alive that much. And the pitching really did it. And now that Corey Kluber was out of the game and wasn't really being himself, it just sticks out even more. And the offense does not save itself, doesn't save the team. Uh, Glaber Torres commits two errors. He had that one catch in center field and the outfield was playing back. I believe this was in like, I want to say the sixth inning. It was actually in the seventh where the two runs scored. Or maybe even the inning before that. But he committed two errors. Um, he had a fly ball in the center field. And I'm not going to blame him 100%. Because the outfield was back and they were positioned back. You can't just you know have the shortstop go all the way out there. But once again, the outfield was back. Labor Torres going out there. That's a routine catch. If it's in your glove, you got to make the catch. If you don't go for it, I'm not going to blame you all that much. Unless it's really, really your fault. But it's in your glove, man. You gotta catch that. Then the one a ground ball to shortstop with the infield partially and throws to Higashoka on a bounce. First of all, even if he did catch it, I may have questioned whether he would have been out or safe. Because you don't throw it on a bounce. You throw it on a line drive. Especially when you got, you know, the infield in or wherever you're positioned in the infield. You throw it home. Higashoka has to make the catch and try to get it to first. But no. What happened that is, you know, two runs scored off the air in Gleyber Torres. You know, that's a throwing error. Don't tell me Higashoka had to pick that because he's a catcher. He's supposed to take it and then throw to first. Trying to get a double play here. What the Yankees are routinely good at. So, Gleyber Torres, again, another bad night for him. And then Yankee killer Randall Grichik hit a homer late to center field. And Higgy drove in both Yankee runs uh, that day. So, good for him. Other than, you know, people... There are people actually blaming him for that one error on Glaber Torres. But Higashoka, he singled, and then he, I believe, doubled in the bottom of the ninth. Yep, doubled in the bottom of the ninth. And he drove in both Yankee runs, though his average is still not very good. It's slightly better than Gary Sanchez. So, once again, the Yankees lose that game due to poor offense. And the stats for the Yankees' bullpen are like this. Corey Kluber, three innings pitched, two hits, two earned runs, three walks, five strikeouts, and a homer given up. Then you got Michael King who came in, three innings, six hits, which is very unusual. One run, one walk, three strikeouts, a home run given up. Then Lucas Ludge, one inning pitched, three hits, two runs, two strikeouts. Then you go down one, Luis Sessa, one inning pitched, one hit, and then Justin Wilson, one inning, one hit, one homer. That was a home run to Randall Grichik. So let's go to game two. And I'm going to talk about some things here because I can. I was not a fan of calling Esteban Florial up. And I understand we need outfield depth. Here's what I'm going to say about that. The Yankees have Brooks Krisky, who literally has not been that great in major league appearances on the 40-man roster. Do we really need him when we already have how many bullpen arms up in the big league? This is, you know, a lot of fans are not creative in their tweets and they don't actually think about things. That's just a fan of people, and I understand they don't like to think out of the box, but you got to think out of the box. There's many center fielders or even outfielders in the minor leagues right now in terms of the rail riders. Esteban Florial was hitting, I believe, a 176 average, and they called him up. And I understand, you know, maybe it'll fill one game, which is actually mistreatment as well, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But Socrates Brito is there. He has major league experience. And I understand Florial too, but that was like one game against the Mets, and then they sent him back down. Socrates Brito was there. If Greg Allen is off the IL, he was there. There were a couple options there you could have went to. Socrates Brito being the number one for right now. I would rather take him over Florial. Sorry. But 
I'm not putting tons of pressure on Estevan Florial when he had a hot start but was only hitting 229. Sorry, batting average matters. And I'll get into something later where people are going off of, you know, something that really wasn't Phil Nevin's fault. But that's later. And going off of, you know, they sent Estevan Florial down after the doubleheader. Which, once again, kind of makes sense because they sent him and Nick Nelson down and now we're back to the 26th man. But my point is, if you're going to keep him up and if you're going to do that and you need depth, why don't you just keep him up? Why don't you just keep him up, send somebody else down, put somebody off the 40 man, do something like that. Don't literally keep him going from up and down and up and down. This is not JT Barrett off of the Saints practice squad here. Okay? Let's treat our top prospects, at least the ones we praise, like their top prospects and either keep them up for a while or don't even call them up until they're ready. And I felt Florial was not ready for the major leagues. A lot of people are excited. Yeah, I'm excited, but he needs to get his work in Scranton. He's only hitting like 176 with two homers and three RBIs. Or even one homer and three RBIs. But my point is, was not ready. Was not ready. So game two, I don't necessarily have a lot of takeaways. I didn't get to watch this game, but does it really look like I missed much? A couple of questions really with this lineup, and it's not it's it's getting stupidly uncreative at this point, and it doesn't work. Uh Rugen out of the door batting second. And he struck out, what, two times against Manoa? Unbelievable. And then once again, we're putting Mike Ford back into the lineup. That's, you know, that's a sin in itself. But hey, when you don't have first base depth, I guess, you know, when you really neglect Chris Gittens and don't take Brooks Krisky off the 40 man, you put Mike Ford in the lineup and then there you go. Goes from there. And also to note, I know a lot of people hate the seven inning doubleheaders. Trust me, I do too. I do too, to the fullest extent. But in terms of the Yankees in this game, especially... If you're not going to go out and protest the seven-inning doubleheaders or actually do something about it, then you have to play with it. The Yankees didn't play with it in the first game. That's what I have to say about that. You know, Odor batting second and then calling up Esteban Florial. Obviously, those are my questions and Mike Ford batting in the lineup. But Herman gave up two straight home runs in the third. Marcus Semien and Bo Bichette. Two potential Yankee killers in the future. If the Rays are on the level they are right now, teeter-tottering in the AL East. Hey, the Blue Jays are coming back up, and they're going to be the next Rays for us, as I said in the beginning. But a solid outing for Alex Manoa. Shout-outs to him. Uh, his family was there, very emotional, very happy about his first start at the stadium. Uh, six innings pitched, two hits, two walks, seven strikeouts. Very good for him. Solid outing. Shout-outs to him. And then Jordan Romano came on for the save. Uh, one inning, one strikeout, and that was pretty much it from there. Domingo Herman, if it wasn't for those two home runs, I would have said that he would have done better. 5.2 innings pitched. He almost pitched a full game. Three hits, two in runs, two walks, five strikeouts, two home runs, obviously, to Bichette and Semien. And then Lucas Lovey came in, gave up one hit, struck out three, and one and a third innings pitched. So that was the full seven. And once again, comes down to the offense. Miguel Andujar was the only guy who got the hits. We got two hits. Miguel Andujar got both of them. And there were barely any base runners. There was, what, two walks. So that's, what, four base runners. You got Andujar twice, the walk to LeMahieu, the walk to Odor. And that was pretty much it. Unless there's some error that I'm not counting for. And I'm pretty sure there was no error. I'm looking in the box score right now. Or something, you know, happened with the catcher's interference, which would have been an error and I would have seen it. And once again... Four base runners the entire game. I don't care where you're playing five innings. I don't care where you're playing three innings, seven innings, nine innings, ten innings. Your offense has to come alive. And when your pitching starts to teeter-totter and falter, the offense has to be there to pick it up. And the offense hasn't been there this season. We can say it a thousand times, and it's the truth. The offense has not been there this season. Let's actually go on to a game where we're going to enjoy talking about a little bit, at least more than these last two games. That's going to be game three. Jordan Montgomery, 4.2 innings pitched, five hits, three in runs, two walks, one strikeout, one home run given up. That was to Bo Bichetti. Well, he's a Yankee killer now. His brother was actually in the Yankee system a couple years ago. I think he's now a manager of some sort in the Yankees minor leagues. It's either him, Dante Bichetti Jr., or uh, Dan Foyerito. I think it's Foyerito who's the manager in the minor leagues. But um, once again, Bo is going to be a Yankee killer. For years to come so the Yankees better be you know locked up and prepared to face him but uh, for the rest of the bullpen 
one inning pitch from Loisaga, he gets the win. One strikeout, you have to pitch five in a seven inning game in order to get a win. Wandy Peralta, uh, third of an innings pitched. And then Chad Green saving the game uh, one inning, and that would be seventh inning. Then Gio Urshela, obviously going in chronological order in terms of offense. Gio Urshela gets the Yankees on the board for the first time in two games. Two days, actually, really, too. Um, with a RBI double. Then the Jays take the lead with a three-run home run from Bo Bichette. Aaron Judge ties the game with a two-run shot. He had a pretty good night. I'm going to credit him there. Then the Yanks take a lead with a go-ahead homer by Gary Sanchez in the bottom of the fourth. He also had a good night. Aside from the base running error, that's not his fault. We'll talk about that in a minute. And Judge knocks in a third RBI with a sack fly. Obviously, that was the final run for them. Carlos Mendoza makes a brutal mistake, and then Chad Green closes out the game. Let's talk about Carlos Mendoza, because a lot of people are just going out there and trashing Phil Nevin when it's not his fault. So I saw Joe the Librarian, who's like a guy on Twitter. He's a Yankee fan, and I'm not going to you know, criticize him for being a Yankee fan. I'm a Yankee fan myself. But we're still blaming Phil Nevin for what Carlos Mendoza did. And when that error was pointed out by Mendoza, in terms of like, you know, Mendoza made the error. When everyone was pointing it out, it was, it was not Nevin. People were still blaming Phil Nevin. Oh, he's got the highest rate in the major leagues of getting uh, runners thrown out at home. Okay, if we're going to care about that percentage, if we're going to talk about that, that it's such a bad thing, that you know the worst thing for us this year has been base running, which it has, and it's been not great, but it's not as the offense. we got to get the offense going for base running to actually get going. But my point is, is that, you know, if we're going to talk about percentage of runners being thrown at home, let's talk about batting average. People don't think batting average is an important stat. And that's unfortunate because a lot of people go into the analytics side of things where home runs are the only things that matter. Uh, Judge and Sanchez, once again, they had good nights. Uh, Sanchez is still hitting like 176. Judge is hitting like 304. So obviously, I'd rather get Judge over Sanchez because I'd rather take the consistent hitting over just home runs every couple at-bats. That's just me. And obviously, that's how baseball should look. But no, obviously, the analytical stage and, once again, that stuff. But we need to stop blaming people who are not in the stadium. <laughs> it's funny. Funny to talk about. You know, we could talk about Nevin's thing another day, but that was Mendoza's fault. And what the hell has Carlos Mendoza done this year? He's bench coach, and I know he hasn't done a lot. But, hey, why are we sticking to Nevin and saying it's his fault and not throwing any shade at Carlos Mendoza? Technically... He messed up all of the credit for Esteban Florial's second major league hit. Hit a double to center field, excuse me, left field, and then he sends him home because it's overlooked now. It's overlooked. The whole Esteban Florial second hit, it's overlooked now because of the Gary Sanchez error. And it wasn't Gary Sanchez's error, it was Carlos Mendoza's. So let's stop, you know, falsely blaming people who aren't even in the stadium and let's talk about Phil Nevin's errors when he makes errors. Let's start taking accountability for the right people here. Let's start making other people feel that they need to take accountability. And then, you know, he said that the Yankees should hire or should have hired Don Mattingly. Oh, oh boy. Jesus Christ. Like, I don't think Mattingly is the worst manager in the world. He obviously didn't do a lot of great things with the Dodgers because they didn't even win a World Series till Dave Roberts got there. But my point is, you know... He's an older school guy. I don't think he's that much into analytics. How do you think New York would have reacted to him? You know, because of what he did in New York that the Yankees are going to take him? I don't know. It just seems like flawed logic here. And now it has to be Boone's fault. It hasn't been Boone's fault, you know, for the bullpen usage and other stuff. But, you know, we couldn't blame him back then because there were a bunch of Boone stands. Now we have to blame him. It just seems like the narrative is mixed up between Yankee fans. That's all. And listen... I have disagreements with the Yankee fans, but my, my point is, you know, stay consistent on your opinion and actually don't falter on it. So with that being said, guys, if you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe, turn on the notification button so you get notified when a live stream pops or a video drops. Um, I might actually do a live stream tomorrow night or something like that. I'm going to get some videos out. One on the Giants, definitely, because there's another topic that's really been concerning me uh, in terms of the confidence of Giant fans, and it needs to go up. It needs to go up in a different sort of manner on a different sort of topic. So with that being said, guys, stay cool and peace out.